Okay. So my name is Marisol Cortez. I'm with Esperanza Peace and Justice. Um, I will say a little bit about Puente de Poder and uh, the current series that we're running and kind of what we're wanting to focus on. But I want to introduce the panelists really briefly first. Uh, we still are waiting on one of the panelists who's running late, but what we've done is flip the order so that he will be last instead of first, and he is on his way, Luis um, Rosales. But we have, um, we have Dylan Daney who will be speaking first. He's with Unite Here, so he'll be speaking about workers' rights and as they're impacted by how the city defines economic development. We have Nettie Hinton, who is a longtime community activist on the east side and all over the city and who uh, most recently has been working with the Hasty Bridge Restoration Group. Um, and we have Maria Berio Saval, who uh, is a former councilwoman and author of the, her book that she just published called Maria, Daughter of Immigrants, uh, telling her story of her family and then also um, her time in, involved in local politics here and what she learned from that experience. So, and then Rudy Rosales, who is a retired professor of political science at UCSA and who wrote the book, uh, The Illusion of Inclusion, The Untold Political Story of San Antonio. So between the four of them, we have a wealth of knowledge about what that term economic development means, where it comes from, whose interests it serves, whose interests it excludes and why, and um, how we might organize to, to shift the way we think about development. So uh, just to give you a little bit of a brief context, this series, this session is part of a community school program that, that we're doing, Puente Se Poder, which means bridges of power, bridges to power, and kind of playing on the idea of the Hay Street Bridge, uh, but also the bridge work that we do as community members to try to um, to explain things, to extend you know, the analysis that we have as community um, and make that analysis accessible to people um, and really just challenge kind of the way that things are thought about, things are done here in the city. Um, I am originally trained as, uh, well, I've kind of shuttled back and forth between the streets and the academy. Um, I got my start kind of thinking about these issues with PGA, and from there went on to get my doctorate in cultural studies, looking at environmental justice stuff in the cities. Um, from there, came back and organized with Southwest Workers Union around climate justice stuff. Went back to the academy and taught uh, for a couple years at the University of Kansas, um, and ultimately decided that my place was here Home, back home with community, and, I, and that I wanted to try to, to build, you know, to do teaching, writing um, collectively in a community process to for the goals of liberation and the goals of social movement. So I think of myself as a community scholar, um, as a kind of liberation sociologist, um, <laughs> and um, the series that we're doing this time around. Uh, is to support the work of the History Bridge Restoration Group, and more broadly, folks that are organizing around um, downtown redevelopment issues generally, and how it impacts the most vulnerable communities. Um, it's called Cities of Hope, Ciudad de Esperanza, and this is the third session. We've, we've showed films, we showed The Garden, about a land grab in, in South Central LA, we showed uh, City of Hope, the, the John Sales film, we did both of those screenings on the Hay Street Bridge. And now we have this panel, which I think tackles, you know, that most infamous of terms that we hear every single day talked about, you know, in the context of from schools to, you know, whatever the city is doing, it's in the name of economic development, right? And so it's really important that we have a critical conversation about what that term means. Um, so that we can decide if that's something we want, or maybe it's something different. If it is something different, uh, you know, what is that different thing we want, and how can we organize to to, uh, to create it, to develop it? Um, so the purpose overall of, of of the community school and of this series in particular is to really try to get to the root causes of these issues. Um, to look deeply into the historical context, the sociological context, 
so that we have the best analysis, the most radical analysis, meaning, and radical just means to the roots, right? That we can, so that the solutions that we come up with as community can be effective. We don't want just band-aid solutions to things. We want to go, we want to understand things on a fundamental level so that we can address them uh, on that level as well. So, um, Oh, oh, Alice, please turn off your cell phone. That's a good reminder for me as well. Um, so, I had some big slides um, that got left in the room. Would you want to look at the big slides that were on the chalkboard? Um, how's everybody doing today? <laughs> I'm really, I'm really, really We're happy. proud and excited. We're happy because how hard is it going to be today? Like 105? 108? 108? Really? Oh. So last time we were trying to have this event, we got flooded out. Yeah. <laughs> and this time around, we're getting bait. Maybe next time, snow. Okay. <laughs> Let us pray. <laughs> and make some really big oversized slides. Um, there's two kind of big ideas that frame the entire series uh, and especially this panel. And the first one is that anytime there's something taken for granted or understood to be sort of the common good, like a term like economic development, the more important it is that we have to question it. So that's the first kind of big idea. Uh, the second big idea is, well, how do we do that? And what we've talked about pre in previous sessions is that it's very important for us to say for whom anytime somebody uses the term like economic development. Economic development for whom? Economic development or to whom? So, you know, when you hear those kind of big buzzwords, you can ask, you can really kind of critically interrogate them and ask who benefits, who loses, who decides, which I've learned, or, you know, Maria has always asked. And, Share her analysis in that way with me. Um, Next slide. Yes. <laughs> um, an important distinction to make when we. Um, oh, Rudy is here! Yay! Yay, Rudy! <laughs> so now we don't have to reverse the order of the speakers, and Rudy, you'll be going first. When we can think critically about economic development in that way, we can make an important distinction between economic development as rhetoric, or how something is talked about, as a code for certain values, certain interests, certain desires, versus the actual quality of life in our neighborhoods and in our communities for the most vulnerable. I think that's important. Um, so we have to make that distinction between the rhetoric and the reality and measure the distance between them in order to have a conversation, right? Some guiding questions that I was hoping that uh, the panelists would address, and if they don't address them directly, we'll be addressing them uh, afterwards. We'll have a kind of more conversational kind of format and Q&A. But along the way, I'm hoping that we can ask or address, one, what is the history of the term economic development? Where did that term even come from? Who first started using it? Why did they start using it? Two, what does that term mean from the point of view of those who use it? What is it a code for? We're thinking about it as rhetoric, as a way of talking about something and not as reality. Three, why is it important that we think critically about it? Four, I'm hoping we can talk about some local case studies where we can see either problems with how the term is used or with the way economic development is defined. So how do we know how do we know that there is a difference between the rhetoric and the reality, in other words? Uh, number five, is economic development as defined by the city ever good? When? Are there case studies for that? How do we tell? I think that's really important. How do we, what are some criteria that we can use for assessing whether a particular project or an initiative is good for our communities and for the most vulnerable in our communities? Six, if it's not economic development we want, then what is it? Do we need a different term? 
and seven, how do we get there from here? And hopefully by the end of the panel, we'll talk about some next steps. Uh, we have a meeting date coming up. We have some upcoming events, and um, I will take it from there. So thank you again, everybody, for coming. And uh, at this point, we'll start with Rudy, who will talk about, from his perspective as a historian, as a sociologist, political I will call you political scientists. scientists. Um, you know, what are the tracks that have been laid for us in terms of economic development? And 15 minutes for each, and I'll be I'll be time to uh -huh. I don't know if I have 15 minutes or so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, first of all, I apologize. I was uh, I thought the entire life is simple, but it gets more complicated. So well, anyway, you, you I am, uh, what, what I wanted to talk about, the, the focus is economic development, but what I, what I want to do is do a kind of a political economy, economic uh, uh, survey of San Antonio. Yeah. So before I start, um, uh, so there, there are, actually, there's a, there's a lot of literature on San Antonio beginning all the way back to the roots of, of, uh, of uh, the Tejano roots of San Antonio, all the way up to through Ramos, through uh, all, all kinds of uh, literature. I wrote a book of the, the, the Illusion of Inclusion. You can't hear me? You can't hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I wrote a book of the Illusion of Inclusion. And, uh, but there really hasn't been any political economic study of San Antonio. Okay, that, that way. No, closer, closer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, there, there really hasn't been any political economics uh, study of San Antonio. And that really, uh, that, that would really tell you the whole story. But, but let, me, let me begin with uh, after World War II. I think after World War II is a relevant history that we want to that we want to trace in order to look at what economic development is. Um, uh, during the war, San Antonio exploded from, from about, uh, I, I think it was about 250,000 uh, population to, to 500,000. It doubled in size overnight. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the world, the, the capitalist system itself was also beginning to go through changes. We think the changes occurred in the 80s and the 90s, and, but, but actually they begin to occur right after World War II. Uh, then the, the major corporations begin to look at how are they going to reorganize uh, and decentralize production. Because if you decentralize production, you break the back of unions. Right? And that was, that's part of the key. The, the whole key in, in, in production in, in, in our system is, uh, is that while we don't like to hear this because it sounds like, oh my God, Marxist, uh, but, it, but it really is about workers and corporations. And, and what, what kind, and, and that means then also communities and corporations, right? So, so uh, after World War II, this it began slowly. They, they begin to look at uh, the, the fleeing uh, uh, industries that were uh, labor intensive from uh, the, the, the Rust Belt or the, or up, up north. And, and, and so, so San Antonio, like many other cities in the southwest, and we, we were called the Sun Belt area, uh, begin to uh, court these businesses. We want them to invest in here. That means jobs. That means uh, that means uh, economic activity. That means growth. And a city that doesn't grow uh, dies, right? Uh, so, from that perspective, then they begin to pay attention to what business needs. They begin to look at what do you need? How can we attract it? What kind of uh, what, what kind of abatements can we can we give you? Uh, on and on and on. And so, so through, the, through the, the first period from about 1950 to about 19, and I, I documented this to about 1977, uh, 78, uh, the, uh, the, there was a group of businessmen uh, from the north side of San Antonio that, uh, who, who brought about the change to, to uh, uh, the city council manager form of government. And the city council manager form of government, I would point out to you, is, is organized exactly like a corporation would be organized. It, it has a, a city council that, is, that was, it originally was elected at large. You had you elected the mayor from the city council, and, and then they hire somebody to run the city. 
corporations the same way. You have a, a board of directors, you, the, 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 the chair comes from the board of directors, and then you hire somebody, a CEO, to run the, uh, the, the, the company. And, and what, what this means is that it creates what they hope is greater efficiency. In other words, uh, uh, less uh, bickering about what the city is about, who can we serve, who's supposed to be served. And, and their, their attitude at the very beginning through the 50s and the 60s was about, not about uh, the, the needs of the community. And in fact, uh, the, the, the horrible conditions of, of, of Mexicanos and Blacks uh, both post, uh, before World War II was just as bad as sometimes worse after World War II because of the lack of simple public services. They'd rather spend their money in, in developing the economy, so economic development so that they could bring the business in. And the argument was that once we do this, you'll get jobs, blah, blah, blah. But in the process, they, 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 ran, they ran ramps out over, over communities. Uh, hemisphere, that wasn't a, a, an economic development project, but because it was about then a practice uh, industry to come in. And what did they do? They leveled an entire community to put hemisphere right there. They actually destroyed the oldest black church in San Antonio without blinking an eye, just like that, right? And and uh, so so this all of this was occurring at this time. And, and meanwhile, a lot of us that grew up in that period, we learned politics by losing. We were always running against the PGL. We were always campaigning against them, doing all kinds of things. We, we lost. We lost all races mostly. Uh, except for a few, and I won't go into the whole political history. I do that in the, in the book. So, so economic development that naturally develops into what are the needs of business? Because, uh, because then the assumption is that if we serve the needs of business, they provide jobs, we become self-sufficient, you know, and on and on and on. Well, we know that, that one of the most important costs in a labor-intensive economy, because it's, it's just, we do have a labor-intensive economy, not a capital-intensive economy. A capital-intensive economy is like Gary, Indiana, where they had a steel mills, right? and, they, and, and they couldn't move anywhere, or like, like the uh, like Ford Motor Company in River Rouge, where they couldn't move anywhere, period. And the unions organized, and they won, at least until they decentralized, right? Uh, so here, it, it was very easy. You start organizing a company, boom, they can leave like that. Boom, they can leave like that. So, so what they were looking at was cutting costs, making more money. So in the end, the, the, the idea of creating jobs kind of gets lost in all that rhetoric. Uh, and, and it's not about jobs, it's about cheap labor. And, and so economic development moves in that direction. Is there a different kind of economic development? I, I think there is, but it has to be uh, through the participation of communities. I think, I think there is because, because if communities can organize and empower themselves, uh, then, then they can begin to uh, at least reach out and control some of that production that is occurring about their lives. Right, right now we depend on everything on, on Walmart, we depend on, on even Costco, the Democratic store is still, is still a, a outside capital. Uh, we depend on the hotels to come in and give us out and, and treat us nice, right? With the, don't they, right? And, and we depend on, uh, uh, and then we, we, we glorify small business, which is okay. But, but in, in the end, uh, it, it's, it's uh, all at the expense of the community. And we don't, uh, we, we don't have any kind of agenda that addresses the community. Cops try to do it. Cops try to address but they were so busy catching up with public services that they didn't get to do much more else. Because, because uh, quite frankly, uh, uh, in the 50s we still had Corrales where you had uh, houses built around one faucet, water faucet, and that was it. Right? The, the, the levels of uh, uh, tuberculosis, uh, the levels of uh, um, am I running out of time? Am I all right? You got about seven minutes. Oh, okay. Uh, um, well, I was talking fast. I've never talked so fast. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the levels, the levels of tuberculosis, the levels of uh, of venereal diseases, the uh, on and on were just incredibly high because because uh, on top of that economic development or below it, 
that the, the, the economic development is on top of that, right? Uh, is is, a, is a, an incredible uh, segregation uh, in San Antonio. Up until up until the, the 1970s, very very few Mexicans moved out of the, the West Side. Harlandale had a restrictive covenant where uh, if you were Mexican, you couldn't buy there. If you were black, you couldn't buy there. Right? And I guess they had to, if you were a Jew, you couldn't buy there. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, but the, the, the point is that, that we were caught, our, our communities also doubled with the doubling of, of the San Antonio population. But we were stuck in one area, and that was the West Side. There was a couple of historic communities, like Sunny Slope, where Highland High School is now, like around the missions. The small communities, the main, the main population was on the West Side. And then you have a, a, a Rico community that was very rich and, and uh, they, uh, as long as they put up with, with the slurs and didn't say much, they could enjoy the, the nice life of a rich person, right? Uh, so that's the, so San Antonio was a true colonial town. Um, and as we, as, as try as we, as try as we may, we can still very difficult to break that image, uh, especially for somebody who grew up in this town, because I see it. And even though we've grown a middle class Mexican community, we've grown a black middle class community, and we've spread out all over San Antonio, although there's still some very lily white communities, uh, usually very wealthy, uh, the, the, the diversity is incredible in San Antonio. But, not, but it's class. It's class because of, of, of the 1.2 million people in San Antonio, there's approximately maybe 20% that are functionally illiterate. The, the, the jobs, uh, the, they're all dead end. Uh, I, I know kid after kid after kid that went to school with my sons, and these are, that went to school with my sons, not out of my generation, who all they look forward to are maybe uh, working long enough in a, in a restaurant where they become manager of the kitchen. Meanwhile, they're working hard. And, and, and this is good. I, I, I talk to a lot of these kids. Well, they're not kids anymore. But my sons aren't kids either. That's a, a look at them. Right? But so so that there, there's there's still uh, economic development, and then somehow the other forgot them. Or if it did, <laughs> five minutes ahead. Okay. If we did forget, if we did forget them, it only, it only thought of them as as as, uh, as part of the cost of labor of of, of uh, economic development. And so, if you have a company, what is your major cost when you're in a labor-intensive economy where most of your money goes into labor? It's labor. And so, so the, there's a tension is there, even if you don't want to call it class struggle. Let's just call it a tension. I'm a businessman, right? A lot of my money goes into labor. What am I going to do? I'm going to look at ways to keep that, the cost of that labor down. And if you're not organized, I have an easier job with doing it. Like, like for example, in the, in the hotels, if you're not organizing, they keep their labor down, the, the, the cost. So, so in, in essence, our communities have become expendable in, in, the, in the general notion, historic notion of economic development. Right? Um, uh, Maria Antonieta, I, I, I have to say this, when she was in, uh, in city council, she was running for mayor. Uh, she, made a, she made a beautiful statement. She said, the economic development has to be about neighborhoods, has to be about children, has to be about old people, has to be about sidewalks, has to be about, you know. And uh, then I, I found another source, beautiful, I caught it all, right, where they, they, they interviewed some insider that, who, in City Hall who didn't want to give their name, said, uh, Poor Maria, she's so ignorant. She doesn't know what economic development is about. <laughs> I mean, this is their, this is their attitude is built in, and they and they they don't even have to consciously define it. It's there historically. It's been built there. What what has to happen? And and I know this is a lot of rhetoric right now, but I'm just saying what has to happen is that communities have to begin to empower themselves, communities have to begin to play a role in deciding who makes the, the decisions in our, in our, in our community. Uh, and we don't have to give away the kitchen sink for a business to come to San Antonio. Because they need the business, right? Yeah. right? Because they'll come, they'll come. 
But, but for, for example, when cops demanded that every corporation, this was in 1978, they demanded that every corporation in San Antonio had to pay a minimum uh, a wage, salary of $15,000 a year. Uh, the, the, the people went berserk, the economic development people, and they went berserk and they sat down with the cops and, and uh, the, the national business magazines were talking about these raving radicals in San Antonio. They were just simply asking for a, a decent salary, right? So what cops did was then, okay, okay, then if you want us to back off, we want, we want libraries in our communities, we want streets, we want curves, we want drainage, we want all of this. Yeah, and and that's, that was an important step in the history, but it wasn't enough. And, and I think that what, what we have to do now is begin to think about how we can empower communities. And the first step, of course, is defining the communities. Okay? So, so uh, uh, that, I, I think I'll leave it there. Uh, uh, and <laughs> was then on the inside of those tracks and will share her experience about what that was like and how it limited the things that she could do, you know, and then what she learned about how things were set up from the beginning and in whose interests. Uh, thank you, uh, and uh, I'm really happy to be um, part of this panel and in front of these uh, very active people. You are, um, because I know many of you, you are a lot of, um, you're powerful people in the city. So thank you for being here. Uh, I, I decided to do a, um, a testimonial. This is a personal statement on kind of one woman's um, view of, of the world. And I'm going to start with a Shiro of mine. And I went all the way to India uh, for a particular reason. Uh, this Shiro of mine is Dr. Vandana Shiva, a physicist who has been working on development, human rights, sustainability, and the environment for many years. She is known and admired worldwide. I looked up some of her writings on the subject that we're discussing today. And the first thing to note is that India is growing very fast and there is increased wealth. However, their growth has brought many problems. Today, for many, they no longer have water. Their rivers and other waterways are polluted. They cannot cultivate their land. Multinational corporations like Monsanto have ruined their crops with GMOs, and there is a lot of poverty. The wealth has not trickled down to the people. In response to all this, Dr. Shiva and her mostly women collaborators have created a grassroots organization. And it's interesting how they are uh, responding. They are um, promoting biodiversity, conservation, organic farming, and the process of saving seeds. They are protecting the seeds for their food and for their future. They are also going back and seeking the knowledge of the and customs of their indigenous communities. The dangers that we talk about that may come to our country if we do not mend our ways have already reached countries like India. Things like lack of water and lots of poor people with no work. So what this woman has to say is very important to me and should be very important to all of us. In a speech she gave some years ago in Berlin, she spoke about walls that need to come down all right. and illusions. illusions. And she said, one of the biggest walls that needs to come down is the wall of illusions. Illusions like growth. Illusions that tell us that the more money that moves in the economy and society, the better off we are. All that economic growth measures 
is the flow of money. It doesn't work out how the money is created. It does not work out in what direction the money flows. It doesn't ask, is this going to destroy nature or build nature? Is this going to destroy society or build community? A powerful statement that she makes in this speech is that, quote, the poor are not the ones who have been, quote, left behind with the current economic models. They are the ones who have been robbed. They are the ones who have been robbed. And when I heard this, I again thought of my maps that I have used for many years in talks all over this country. And one of the maps that I'll pass around is this map that describes the growth of San Antonio. Rudy was talking about it. And as you can see, the, the darker areas are new growth uh, between, uh, well, the whole, the whole um, growth is between 1961 and 1998. And all the growth is to the north and over our Edwards Aquifer. The other map that I have, and I'll pass it on to, is a map based on two, uh, 2000 census statistics. And you can see where the poverty is in the city. Still in older areas of the city, although I'm sure it has spread. Uh, south side, east side, and west side. What we have not done in the city, as Rudy has stated, is stop and ask what growth and expansion, which was the goal of the GGL Bank in 1951-55, when they created the current city charter, we've never stopped to ask, what has this done for nature, and what has this done for people? Who has been robbed? For me, as I think of these profound questions, I think of my childhood in the west side of San Antonio. I was a child in the 40s and 50s, a young woman in the 60s, and we lived in a small house on a 25-foot lot that when it rained, our backyard <clears throat> flooded like a lake. It was unsanitary as it started to dry up. When it rained, my mother had to carry my older brother, who had asthma, to school because he would get sick if he got wet. The, the rest of us really had a good time because we got to walk in the water. We didn't know any better. My father <clears throat> earned measly wages in his job as a laborer, and my mother had the job of making a home for a family of eventually eight people. We did not have parks nearby, nor sidewalks, and the streets were in horrible shape. But we belonged to a very special community where people may do with what they had. They helped each other and worked hard to improve their lives, to educate their children, and to contribute through their work and involvements to build community. In other words, there were positives and negatives going on, problems but also opportunities in the kind of people we were. And this is still going on, by the way. I was fortunate that with this background, I was able to serve as an elected official, a city councilwoman, for a whole decade. And I say fortunate because I knew who had been left behind, who had been robbed. And I ran for public office because I wanted to help these neighborhoods where my constituents now lived. At the time, District 1, which I represented, was smack in the heart of the city with its old neighborhoods, including the ones in which I was raised. Because of this knowledge, my priorities were, in some of them, rehabilitation and repair of older housing to provide for more stability within families, drainage, improvement and enhancement of public spaces, recreational opportunities for youth, protection of our historic structures, services for children, youth, the elderly, for families, fair allocation of resources, protection of our natural resources like water as our city grew, and to assure that those who benefited by new growth paid their fair share. But what a surprise to go in with these intentions and find that the economic development that we pursued was the one of growth and expansion. 
that extended the city to the north, away from the older areas of the city, and those I represented, and those I represented, um, and over our Edwards Aquifer Recharge Zone. What a surprise to see that each week we rezone the properties over the aquifers so they could be developed later. What a surprise to see big ticket items like the Alamo Dome, which was built with a sales tax, and Fiesta, Texas, which was built with a huge tax abatement, become realities. And that my constituents had to help pay the bill as they continued without their share of progress. These were the models for economic development I faced, and they are still there. While we hear words of investments in people now, and that is good because the words must come first, we still have not changed the goal of growth and expansion in our city. We have not examined exactly what kind of growth means for what kind of growth means for our city. And Eddie will talk about a very real situation here in the east side, so I want to address that one, and that's the Hay Street Bridge. Now, why do, that, why do I say we have not examined this growth? As an example, there's something on the table right now that is going to be a real test for our San Antonio City Council. It is the latest development called Crescent Hills that will be over our Edwards Aquifer Recharge Zone and is totally in Comal County. SAUS, the entity that provides water in our county, has voted to provide water and wastewater to that development. That means that all of us, rich or poor, will pay for it through our water bills. And in this action, there is more development risks for water, for our money. Uh, it will require more money to develop it and something else. There are from 15 million to 20 million Mexican free-tailed bats, murcielagos, which fly out each night to get their food. It is the largest bat colony in the world. And the, bat, the bats will be flying over and hanging around, literally, on top of all those houses. The development is bad for the aquifer, bad for our pocketbooks, and bad for the bats. And there is no place for the process of approval of this development to discuss the impact on the bats or where people can go and discuss the impact on our water or our pocketbooks. So why are we doing it? I think it is because, well, I don't think I know, there are big business interests that have incredible power over these decisions. In addition, I don't think there are enough people who are informed about what is going on in the world around them. I think because there are not enough people who understand that when other living creatures like birds and bats are harmed, we as humans are also at risk. Because there are not enough people who make the connections between paying taxes and what we get for them. For example, more money leaving the inner city's tax base, like we did in the 60s and 70s to begin with, was less money for our public schools. And yet, those in the inner city still pay taxes that help the new development, and we are taxed proportionately more for our public schools than other areas of town. It is because not enough of us see the poverty nor what the poverty among us. Because when we see huge government expenditures made, we do not ask who benefits and who pays. Because definitely not enough people engage government by voting, and sadly, painfully, because even when we do involve, our voices are not respected, nor our demands heeded. We've learned that. And also because enough of us do not take time to be informed so that we can be in a position to hold our elected officials accountable. Lastly, or a lot more, because we are still not united in our cultural, social, economic, and geographic differences. We do not yet realize that what hurts one side of town hurts the other, 
and that what hurts the undocumented immigrant hurts us, and that what hurts people clear across the earth, like India, hurts all of us. We have a lot of work to do. That is why this gathering today is so significant, and the whole process of Puentes de Poder. That is why people like you today continue to educate, question, organize, speak out, write, and engage each other as they connect the dots on the cur all the current issues. So you who are here become real hope and people of great power. I think what we need to do all together is start creating a, a new vision for our city that's different and it's very hard. And some of us who are the oldies but goodies probably won't see it. But there are young people like the two who organized this panel, Marisol and Jolene and all the other young people that gather. Uh, and that is where our hope is. And we who are the older ones uh, will be here to support you. Thank you very much. Next up is Nellie Hinton, and uh, she's going to going to talk a little bit and kind of bring it down to the neighborhood level. So some of these big forces that Maria and Rudy were talking about, how do they play out uh, sort of locally on a community level, and especially in you know the Hay Street Bridge case? Good morning, everybody. Back of the room, can you hear me? Okay. Um, we we are happily being hosted today by um, a faith community here on the east side, um, the Friendship Missionary Baptist Church community. And I really think we need to stop and pause right now and, and bring that religious affirmation of, of what we are about into play. And we've got a minister in the room, and I'm gonna ask Reverend Lundfield, who's talking, I mean writing at the moment, if he won't come forward and, and say a few words to, to bring God's grace down on us so that what we're doing today and what we do in the future will, will have his commendation to it. Because we're doing the right things for the right reason in this instance. Reverend Bill. Thank you, my friend and sister, Mary let me say good morning to each of you. I hope that each of you will be taking positive notes because what they are about to bring forth is things that you can have once you understand and know how and what to do and when to do and make them the directions of our city. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, thou creator and governor of life, we as your children come before you, first of all, in thanksgiving, that you have blessed us once again to open our eyes and to see yet another day. Oh, Father, we thank you for killing us in our sound mind. Now, Father, we just ask that you give us the strength, the attitude, as well as we need to let those know that we can make a difference, but only through your power and through your grace and your wisdom, that we can make a better city for each of us, in regards to who we are or to where we might live, to know that it can be a healthy city and that we can prepare a future, but in that future that you may be in down with us. We ask that you just let each of these here participants here, these whom are sharing their knowledge and wisdom, grant right unto them uh, the love and the understanding as well as the knowledge and wisdom that we may all share and be a better people serve you as well as into our community. We love you. We thank you for the things that you do with us, through us, and for us. And as always, we will pause and give you the praise and glory. For it's in Jesus' name we solemnly pray. Everybody say amen. Amen. And amen. Thank you. Thank you. When I um, was asked to be on this panel, I uh, approached people in my East Side community and and ask them the question, what is economic development anyway? And, and you can imagine that I got a lot of different responses. So I'm gonna ask you right now to, to think for a minute or two. 
What does economic development mean to you? What does it bring to mind? What does it propel the city? What does it propel you? What does it propel your community, organizations, whether they're religious, nonprofit, or for profit, to be doing to meet the definition of economic development? I'm going to give you a few minutes, not a few minutes, just a few seconds, to think about it. To you, what does economic development mean? Now, you probably realize it's kind of hard to get your hands around the subject because it does mean different things to different people. In the part of the conversation we've had already this morning from the professorial sort of a standpoint and from the, the uh, elected official community activist sort of a standpoint, there are differences in what it actually means. To, to some people, um, economic development and I think the city falls into this kind of a, of a, of a category, it refers to increases in what's known as gross domestic product, GDP. It's what our city fathers and mothers keep talking about in making San Antonio a world-class city. And it's the things that would the the corporate entities, the other kinds of, of uh, opportunities that would put San Antonio on the map and would increase the profit flow to those corporations or to the city in terms of the kinds of tax advantages that they will get as a, as a result of being one of these leading economic lights in, in, in the country. So it's tied to um, the, the domestic economy and what also happens in the state of Texas. And if you listen to our governor speak, Governor Goodhead Gonzu, uh, you hear him constantly talking about the, the economic incentives that Texas offers that other states do not offer. And that's why he's been to California and other places uh, asking for those groups of people to come to Texas because we've got things to give you, tax incentives, rebates, all kinds of wonderful things, and you can do your business here in Texas. So that all refers to gross domestic product and, and income. But economic development on the, hand, on the other hand implies something much more significant. And the indicators of economic development. It's not the amount of money that your corporations are making. But for me, the indicators are things like literacy rates, life expectancy, poverty rates, environmental quality, social justice, leisure time that you can afford, and things that the city is promoting that you can afford to participate in not just the tourists among us. I found in talking to people and in myself, I have a profound sense of disappointment in how the city has approached economic development on the east side. And among the people that I talked to on the east side, there was one consistent view, simply stated, just as all politics is local, economic development, if it is truly to benefit the community, it too must be local. Now, for me, economic development brings goods and services and economic value that improves the quality of life in the community. And under this definition, for me, economic development must be altruistic and not mercenary. Now, those two models for me says this. The, the mercenary model uses the community, takes from the community, while making certain that little or none of that money generated by the enterprise circulates within the community. Let, let's take a, a, a closer look and two projects sold to Eastsiders as economic generators, the Alamo Dome and the AT&T Center. Altruistic model, you know that it's gonna bring things into the community. 
mercenary model is going to take things out of the community, particularly the money. I ask you, how much money circulated by those two so-called East Side economic generators circulates at least one time in the community before it flees to bank accounts in more affluent parts of town? Alamo Dome, AT&T Center. A dollar spent at either of those places never, ever circulates on the east side. To the detriment of the community, even the existing infrastructure has been modified in order to make these venues easily accessible for others who live someplace else. For example, Houston Street, from the Rumpel's Avenue to Rio Grande, is residential. However, that stretch now has a continuous turn lane right down the center that prevents homeowners from parking in front of their homes. Even when there is absolutely nothing going on at the AT&T Center or the Coliseum. And a lot of those homeowners have been there a very long time. And so they're old folks like me, I'm 74. So if you don't have a driveway, and many of them don't, and if you do have a driveway, it only accommodates probably one vehicle, and you may have a family that has at least two vehicles in it. If you can't park in front of the street, you've got to park around the corner, down the block, and then walk back in order to get into your own home where you are a taxpaying citizen for it. On uh, SBC Parkway, it used to be called that AT&T Parkway, which started out years ago as Coliseum. Traffic patterns for events makes it almost impossible for homeowners living off Belgian Lane to get to and from their residences or to the Bella Cameron School because they change the traffic patterns with police and cones so you can't get out of your neighborhood to get to 35 or to get to Houston Street or to Congress Street. You've got to go a circuitous route all the way up to WW White Road to access things. Tell you what happened during the playoffs with me. Um, I parked over where Handy Andy used to be, where you, you've got the lovely pond and the, the fountain. I parked over there, walked across the street to get into AT&T Center. When the game was over, and it was happily one week long, I could not go the most direct way to my home, and I live on Hackberry and, and Nolan Street. I had to make a right turn out of the parking lot, go up Coca-Cola to Commerce, make a left turn on Commerce, go up to I-10, stay on the access road, up to Martin Luther King's, make a right on Martin Luther King, <laughs> drive all the way up to Martin Luther King, Make the dog leg at the cemetery. Get on Iowa Street. Make a right turn on Hackberry when I finally got there and then get to my house and get into my driveway. That's because the infrastructure has been changed to make it easy for those dollars that are not circulating in my community to have easy um, egress from something that's supposed to be an economic generator for my community. No. We did not get money circulating. We got traffic jams from AT&T. And if you can remember Alamo Dome, what did we get? Toxic dirt. All in the name of economic opportunity. Now the east side hungers for economic development. And why? Because we anticipate receiving what economic development has brought to other parts of San Antonio. Look at the map that Maria showed you. It all goes north, doesn't it? We want quality schools. We want better housing. 
We want job opportunities that are not mired in the low-wage tourist, convention, entertainment service industries. Now, don't get me wrong. We welcome service industries, some service industries, particularly those dominated by business services, healthcare, technology. And we wonder why it is that the movers and shakers in San Antonio's government and corporate sectors actively recruit new manufacturing office, research and development operations, and then place them on the north and northwest sides of town. Now, what I call the northwest side of town is Marty Winderland. <laughs> Does anybody get the pun? Say that again. Marty Winderland. Oh, yes. <laughs> Google Marty Winder <laughs> and see what development that you get in the northwest sector of town, which is why I call it Marty Winder. Land. And why on the east side do we get more of the same old, same old, meaning warehouses, truck stops, and landfills? Have you been on the south side lately? Look at the development that has been sparked by the Brooks City based vision. If you haven't been, go. If you haven't been, go. Now, we experienced the highly touted Eastside Summit, where are the catalytic projects for us that were promised that are now so highly visible on the South Side. Now, I don't want to make this sound like we're trying to denigrate South Side development, North Side development, Northwest development. We just want our share of the development, and we haven't been getting there. And I don't see the vision for the East Side. And considering that location, location, location is what drives much of the real estate investment, we would think that because we have Fort Sam Houston and Sansi, that we would have experienced the kind of development that Brook City Bakes brought. The added value that those places brought to us. And look at Fort Sam's mission as it relates to medicine, cybersecurity, and 21st century techniques. Only three minutes left. Oh, Lord, I'm going to have to talk really fast. <laughs> we are in an, empower an empowerment zone. And the empowerment zone designation provides the city priority funding in the areas of public health, education, and human services, which can give us tremendous boosts in our neighborhoods for revitalization areas. Now, my east side downtown neighborhood has been selected for a uh, $23.6 million promised neighborhood grant. We have also been given a HUD grant, a multi-million dollar one, to demolish the Wheatley Courts and to rebuild it as a modern housing site and to make it into a model development. What do our city fathers and mothers believe we need in our promised neighborhood? A brewery, <laughs> a restaurant, and a beer pub. And they took land that the Hay Street Bridge Restoration Group got donated to be a park, to be an amenity next to the Hay Street Bridge, which we saved through the petition process, meaning we involve folks like y'all, to save the bridge from being dismantled so that we could continue to have connectivity from our downtown east side neighborhood to downtown and the revitalized mission reach of the river. We then went to Austin and we, we seriously, seriously worked very hard to make certain that we could get $2.9 million of federal money to restore the bridge so that it could become a part of the city's hike and bike trail. What did the city do? They reneged on the park. Patty Giovanni, Mr. Ethics, then decided to strike a deal with a guy who has a brewery that he does in Blanco with 10 employees to essentially give him the land with the tax incentives and the tax breaks that they do for the big corporations to build a brewery and then a licensing agreement 
which would give him control of the right of way under the bridge, let him build a skywalk from his brew pub onto the bridge, and then give him most of the bridge decking for restaurant tables, umbrellas, and chairs so that they can drink beer on the bridge. Now you know for a few hundred dollars you can close any public thoroughfare for any time, which meant he could close it so that we, the citizens, the neighbors, would not have access to it at 4th of July next weekend. Come and watch the fireworks. The current in its best of San Antonio, y'all voted and said the third best place to see the city's fireworks is from the Hay Street Bridge. He can close it and he can become a private party. We would not be able to be on the Hay Street Bridge. We don't need another alcoholic beverage serving site so that people can be drunk and drive the wrong way on 28137, maim themselves and kill other folks. We need to surround our neighborhoods, our community, our churches, the Healy Murphy Center. The, hopefully we will get a pre-K um, child care development center on the east side when they do that next one. Those are the kinds of the opportunities that we need. Um, am I through with my three minutes to go on? Um, I want you to know if you're from District 2, that if you go up Broadway, on the east side of Broadway where 1800 Broadway is, up to where the new Children's Museum is gonna be across from Lions Field, that's now a part of District 2. And the new zoning regulations are taking the cottages, the small houses in our communities in Government Hill and in Dignity Hill and using the new mixed use zoning designation to turn each of those little cottages and houses into restaurants, bakeries, cigar bars, and all kinds of things that will feed the apartment dwellers who will be in those high-income units along Broadway. Just as at Sunset Station, the Zachary's who control downtown development built a condominium union, a unit called Vidora, which is directing what happens in the Dignity Hill neighborhood. When we get to Q&A, ask us about zoning and what's happening in the neighborhoods. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, just want to say thanks to Esperanza for organizing this. I see a lot of friends here, um, and it feels pretty good um, to be up here. Um, I really appreciate the perspectives that we've gotten, sort of like laying things out um, in a bigger context. I'm going to speak from a pretty specific uh, frame to look at economic development in San Antonio, and that's through the hospitality um, industry, which I think is pretty important um, when you're thinking about the question of economic development because of the hundreds um, of millions of dollars that have been spent in the name of economic development on the hospitality industry. Um, it is the fourth biggest industry in the city. Um, we're um, serving about 25 million tourists, convention goers a year. Um, and it's about 100,000 people uh, estimated now who work in industries uh, connected to hospitality. So that's everybody from the cab drivers uh, running to and from the airport to the cooks, to the housekeepers, uh, to the servers. Um, and I'm gonna speak specifically from my own experience um, with two, um, two projects, two entities in the city who have um, spent enormous amounts of public taxpayer money um, in there to, to come into existence, which is the Grand Hyatt uh, downtown, the main convention center hotel, um, and then the convention center itself, um, which has been ex expanded multiple times and we're on track, I think, for another $330 million expansion. Um, that is, if people don't know, um, connected to the general fund. It is no longer being financed out of uh, 
tax dollars. It's connected to the general fund of the city council, um, which is pretty troubling if people saw the headline this week that we're being told we're in a shortfall. Um, so the Hyatt project um, was about uh, represented about $207 million in taxpayer money that was um, spent, and that was a mix of federal funding um, through empowerment zones and, and a mix of municipal bonds. Um, I will say that when you get into the money that's going into the hospitality sector, it is coming from all levels of government. It's municipal, it's state, um, and it's federal tax dollars that are being used um, to, to fund these projects. And the county, excuse me. Um, so $207 million spent to build the Hyatt project. Uh, we were lucky that there were groups, uh, groups like COPS uh, who, you know, fought um, for a long time um, to get some, I guess, basic minimal uh, expectations uh, into the deal, right? Um, the Grand Hyatt was built um, under the, with the understanding that they would pay uh, a, quote, living wage uh, minimum when it opened of ten dollars an hour, um, and I just want to talk to you about my experience um, there. I, I've been in the hotel industry for a number of years. I started as a security guard and moved on to be a banquet server, um, and I worked for the Hyatt um, as a banquet server in Indianapolis. And um, I actually helped open the Grand Hyatt um, as a banquet server back in 2008. Um, I remember when they offered me the position. For those of y'all that don't know, in banquets, the way um, our servers have been traditionally compensated is through a service charge, through a gratuity. Um, we work for gratuities. That's where our livelihood come from, comes from. And it is um, it is a job in the hotel industry that in many parts of the country is a middle class, uh, a middle class job. Uh, you can make good money because the hotels charge so much for the product that the gratuity ends up being rather large. And I remember when they offered me the position here in San Antonio, my food and beverage director said to me something along the lines of like, we're, we're going to do things a little differently. We do things a little differently down here in San Antonio. Uh oh, you're not going to make you're not going to get paid your tips. I know you got paid tips in, in Indianapolis and maybe that was great for you, but we're going to pay you by the hour and we're going to keep the service charge. Um, but don't worry, it's better for you. Right. It's. It smelled funny from the beginning, um, you know, when you're sitting in a booth getting told you have a new job and moving to a new city, there's not much room to negotiate. Um, so, you know, I of course said, well, that sounds great. Um, and showed up the first day. Um, what I found is that, um, you know, a project like this where we are promising, where, where the city is promising uh, good jobs to the people of San Antonio. That's why we have to give these hotel owners and construction companies millions of dollars. That's why the city has to back up this debt. Um, resulted in um, a job that was unique. Um, the same corporation that's taking this money is only here in San Antonio. This is the only place I, I as uh, I kind of wear two hats here. I work with the Hotel Workers Union, um, so I talk to hotel workers all around the country, and um, and as a former hotel worker. Uh, only here in San Antonio do they do they keep all of this gratuity. It's unique, That's awesome. um, and I think the unique exploitation that happens here um, to workers on a daily basis um, is important to look at um, when people are standing there talking to us about how great economic development is going to be, um, and worse, why they need our taxpayer dollars to fund it. Um, this is happening um, all over San Antonio. Um, the standard here for servers is one of the lowest in the country. Um, that's why at the convention center, um, which our city is highly connected to, funding has a lot of influence over what happens there, they steal more of the tip at the convention center than they do um, in the Hyatt. There are workers who uh, I have met at the convention center who've been there for 20 years. They have never been paid their tips, um, and you know they uh, many of them are making less than uh, 11 dollars an hour. Um, after 20 years, after 20 years. Um, folks who have you know not seen a raise in in 10 or 15 years. The 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 problems with the gratuity are serious. 
I would argue there are even more serious problems um, in this industry um, that is highly subsidized um, when it comes to subcontracting. Um, for those of you who don't know, in the hospitality industry, um, in our convention center, in our hotels, um, subcontracting is a uh, widely used practice to exploit workers uh, even further. Um, in the Hyatt, which was given the city money, um, when it opened, there were approximately, um, it was approximately 80 um, men and women who worked directly for the Hyatt, which meant they had access to benefits, um, um, they had sick days. Um, so I'm not trying to paint a rosy picture, but they actually worked for the Hyatt. And what we've seen since that hotel opened, took this money, so over the course of five years, um, now we have in the housekeeping department almost, um, I, I think right now we're at about, um, let's say, 50 out of the 80 housekeepers are subcontracted, which means they have no job security, no sick days, no benefits. Um, they are giving up, right? The way subcontracting works is the hotel is paying, say, $15 an hour per worker. Five of those dollars are going to a middleman. Um, and on top of that, I'll just add for folks who may or may not, for some of you who might not be familiar with the hospitality industry um, and the level of exploitation that happens in San Antonio, in housekeeping in general here, it is also the worst place to work um, in, in, in the country. Um, it is the place where it's, it's, I always say to people, this is what it looks like when the companies can do whatever they want. Um, which means for housekeepers, cleaning um, up to 30 rooms, 32 rooms in a day. In an eight hour day. Um, we fight as an organization, right, in our, in our union shops. Our fight in housekeeping is all about that standard. Um, and in many major cities in this country, um, we have, um, we have been able to bring that number down to 14 rooms a day. I mean, that, and that in itself is a lot. Um, but you're talking about double here. Um, so the subcontracting, though, <laughs> I will say, it is, uh, it's particular to housekeeping. Um, it's particular to that department. It, it is also how um, these hotels are uh, explo exploiting um, folks who don't have documents. The hotels don't do it directly, they get somebody else to do it. Um, and it is, it's ruthless. Um, and it's happening all over downtown. It is happening in all the places um, where we're giving public tax dollars um, to fund these projects. Um, and I, I think, um, I, I, I think like, we have to ask ourselves like, when economic development is happening, what does it mean for workers? Especially in the hospitality industry. Um, the amount of money that's been spent down there, in terms of it actually getting back to the community, how does it come back? Generally, it's only opportunity to come back is through wages, through jobs. And it is an open question of what kind of jobs those are. Um, and I don't, um, and I, well, I will also add, I think since I have time, um, there's pretty interesting, uh, it's pretty cool, we have a, there's a guy in San Antonio, I recommend folks checking out his work, named um, Haywood Saunders, who's a professor at UTSA, who is probably one of the uh, top academics uh, uh, kind of running around the country critiquing the amount of money that's being blown on convention centers and convention center hotels. Um, and he put out an article recently that I thought was pretty interesting called One More Hotel that looked at the fact that, um, you know, we've gone from um, 18,000 rooms to about 44,000 rooms from the 80s to 2012. So we've been expanding, continuing to spend this money. We just signed off on another convention center uh, agreement. And, um, you know, before the last convention center um, expansion before the Grand Hyatt was built, um, we actually had more convention center hotel room nights, more business in this town than we have now. It's a, and you could argue that, well, we had to do it to keep, 
keep up with the other cities because it is true that all around the country it's the same model, right? Spend all this money on convention center hotels, spend all this money on expanding your convention center. You need to do it to keep up, to keep the money coming in, flowing into the city. Um, but it is a real question of whether that's benefiting the city and who it's benefiting. Um, and it looks like I've got a couple minutes left. I just, so I did want to remark, because I think a lot of what we've been talking about is um, it's pretty sobering, it's pretty depressing and upsetting to learn that this is where the, you know, how much money is being spent and what's happening with it. So I do have two points of optimism in this. Um, in this, One, if people didn't know the story of the Marochan plant that re people recently tried to build, uh, or that a, a deal that recently got tried to, or folks tried to make with the county, it wasn't a deal as large as the Hyatt, but it was $10 million, $15 million that was gonna be given away um, in subsidies to this company. Um, Folks organized a press conference with 50 people. I was there, it was not huge. Couple news, folks came out, the, the, and they did a good job of getting the press. It took one press conference and one news story, and Marochan called um, the city and said, look, we don't need the money, we'll come anyway. Um, and that was a, a deal where the city was gonna give Marochan this money. It was five, the promise of 550 jobs, 500 of those jobs were subcontracted jobs, temp jobs, minimum wage, no benefits, no rights, um, which is completely insane that we would hand that money over. Um, but it is a point of optimism for me because it is a reminder that they are afraid of us, right? Sometimes a small action can move and change something because they are afraid. Um, and the other point of optimism, at least for me, and I don't want to comment on, like, I think it's a big question for a lot of us what comprehensive immigration reform is going to look like. Um, and I think uh, I don't want to speak to the controversies around it right now and what's happening with the Obama administration. I think a lot of us are upset about it. But I do think we're seeing um, the potential for some kind of reform to come through. And I think for when we're thinking about the subcontracting problem and we're thinking about the potential to organize change, the fact that there may at some point in the near future be a um, path for folks to get status that is gonna enable them to fight. Um, because I think right now these companies, they're taking advantage of the precarious position in this gray area that exists in the country because we haven't dealt with um, dealt with the, 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 this economic problem. And, um, and so I am optimistic from, from that perspective because I spend a lot of time standing outside the, in the sun, outside the Hyatt and the convention center talking to a lot of those workers. And I do know that um, if we are able to get some reform, maybe not this time around, but at some point, we are able to get some reform. It's going to be a lot of workers who are ready to fight, who are going to stand up, who are going to come forward. And I don't, I mean, I'm a union organizer, so I look at it that way. But I, I do believe that, um, that to change this, we're going to have to organize and we're going to have to fight. Um, so thank you all for, for listening. We'll do Q&A. Thank
So I, I have a little answer for that, Mari. So uh, the, the first time that I started uh, hearing the term economic development that was really broadly used in San Antonio was around 1977 or six when Henry Cisneros was a councilman of District 1 and he had a big uh, convention center uh, meeting totally on what is economic development and how do we achieve it for San Antonio. And I remember going, the place was packed in one of the exhibit rooms, and but it was, it was different people who presented, largely business people, all the chambers, and it was, you know, uh, the, what Rudy was talking about. But that's the first time that I heard it uh, in, the, in the city. It may have been before, but it made a splash because of who Henry was and the hope that he had gotten elected and people had so much hope in him. Thank you. And um, just a suggestion, maybe those who want to ask the question come up to the, the mic so that since we are being recorded. And by the way, thanks so much to Nowcast for coming out. We're really excited that you're here. Um, just so that we can hear as much as I might hear the question. Thank you. Uh, young man, you're my hero. My father was a union organizer back in Germany after World War II when they were exploiting the unemployed uh, brick workers. He literally had to work in ovens. Today, he is in a rest home with a dust lump. But he did what he could, so my hat's off to you. But you only touched the corruptness and the crookedness with the hotels and what's going on in the city. And Maria might know who I'm referring to. I will not mention any names. When uh, the pink elephant, that's how we used to refer to it, down on the river, uh, which one is that? I can't think of it. When they were getting, it's the tax abatements. Folks, you have no idea. They're giving away the baby and the bathwater. I went down there to address them along with the priest from Our Lady of Guadalupe. I think uh, it was Lulaf and some others. And what this, this is a vicious cycle. You need to wake up, you need to raise hell. Go ahead, get locked up, it's worth it. And what's going on, and I know of what I speak, I used to be in the real estate industry outside of this city and state. We are, or we have been for the last 20 years, the biggest plum in the free world be plugged for the hotel industry. We have the lowest land cost. There's no other city of the size anywhere near to San Antonio where you can buy dirt cheap land on a famous river, major roadways, fee simple, means you own it. Everywhere else they rent it at great fees. Then you get it built at lower cost than anywhere else because we know where our cement workers come from and they have uh, what is contracts. What is it's not a question. I'm bringing you more information. Then they have high hotel rates, high hotel room rates, high occupancy rates, low wages, no benefits. And you know what, where the profits go? None of them come to San Antonio. The switch. Okay. None of them come to San Antonio. Wake up, folks. The profits go to Houston, to New York, to China, to Shanghai, but none of them come here. And unless we get radical, we will keep on being a colonial society because that's, folks, what we really are in the hotel industry, in the entertainment industry, in the inner city. I used to have acquaintances, to include a mayor, that, were, that I could call up and say, hey, look, my famous little speech was, and that includes the county commissioners, they gave it away too. Atkins, Elizondo, all of them, they gave them the tax abatements for 10 or 15 years because they say they can't operate and make a profit. Well, guess what happens when those years are up? They sell, then they need to have the same tax abatement so they can remodel and stay viable. You are getting great over and over and over. And what I used to tell Howard, y'all know who I'm talking about. I said, Howard, I hope you all are crooked. I hate to think that our city is led by somebody as stupid as you are. <laughs> Letting these, these inter, international operators, you know, rape you, take our money. That's all I have to say. Thank you.
and, uh, and the reproduction of labor. And that's where the struggle occurs. If we don't know we're in a struggle to define our city, they'll take it away. Um, I was listening to this, and I wasn't entirely sure what economic development was going to be about before I got here. And um, it sounds like it's a great idea. It's just not really being handled correctly. And I guess I'm curious as to what the individual can do with this problem. Um, I know that you can join a group, and you can be active in all these other ways. But like, as an individual, I feel really powerful with this. What can you do? I. For myself, since I'm a musician, I know that what I often do is I hold performances and let people know like there are good things happening in the youth of San Antonio and that there's a bright future ahead of us. And by example, I'm having a concert soon at the Carver Cultural Center on the 14th. And it's going to be displaying the music of the youth of San Antonio. But I'm wondering what can most people do in order to feel like they have an effect with this issue? I, oops, what's happening? <clears throat> I, I would like to specifically talk about HZ Bridge. For those of you all who are not very familiar with what is happening, we have filed suit, and it is the restoration group, and it is also a class action suit that uh, includes everybody, more than 2,000 people, who signed on to the petitions that we walked uh, all of the communities in San Antonio to get people to sign. We are scheduled to go to court for a jury trial on the 7th of October. Now you also need to know that we have had two small victories in the court already. Uh, the first one is, and, and the suit is of course uh, similar to what was played out in state legislature uh, the last couple of weeks. Our suit was that the sale of the land intended for a public park not to be um, uh, determined by city council or city staff, but that it come to you, the citizens of San Antonio, the taxpayers, to determine whether or not the sale of that land to be a brewery next to a historic bridge is appropriate for the city of San Antonio. Um, the, the, two, the, the state legislature was dealing with that same statute because uh, Mike Villarreal in the House of Representatives and Senator Leticia Van Depute had bills in Austin that would allow the legislature to take away from you as citizens the opportunity to vote on what happens in the development of Hemisphere Park. Now you know Hemisphere Park is a, a much huger issue for the city than our small little park next to the Hay Street Bridge. But it was the same statute that was being considered and they went to Austin to have the legislature rule that the city could make those decisions without coming to you to vote on each one of the changes they were doing. Now it was going through with no problems. It was sailing until the Zacharies you know, who are these people running San Antonio, decided that they wanted a tourist hotel on the Hemisphere site. Now, Mike Villarreal had worked assiduously to make certain that the development of that site would be 80% for public use, parkland and things that would be advantageous to us, the citizens of San Antonio, and not something for the tourist, entertainment, and convention business. And only 20% could be for other uses, commercial and otherwise, because there are people who still want to put apartments and other commercial things in the park. So he was limiting it to 20%. The Zachary's jumped in there and wanted to put a tourist hotel. And it, it, it almost derailed the whole thing that they were trying to do. Finally. The powers that be must have muffled him, and the tourist hotel has, at least for the time being, gone the, the way of extinct animals. And, and perhaps we will do at 80. Just to make sure that Gary gets this question answered and also that if there's anyone else on the but you, but you have to have the understanding. See, because you've got to follow doubts here in San Antonio. They assume 
We have very short attention spans and don't remember anything. And if you don't remember anything and connect those dots, you, dots, you will not know what's happening. So they managed to say you are not going to vote on the Hemisphere Park and the changes that they made to it. But they're trying to keep us from putting on the ballot that you will have a say as to whether or not the parkland next to the Hay Street Bridge will be used as a park and not for something else. Now the two victories that we've had, um, the developer Eugene Seymour, who is the son that a former mayor never had, and his spokesperson was a person who was a part of the city manager's office. So you're talking about people who are really hooked up. He wanted to join on the city side. That's the, the, this, the lawsuit uh, claiming that he had standing because the city was going to sell him the parkland. But there has been no sale of the parkland because our you know, suit and everything we've been doing has derailed that for the moment. Went to court with, um, in the county courthouse and the judge did not allow him to join that suit with Sharon Scully in the city of San Antonio. The next thing they took us to court on was on the MOU that the city said that the restoration group had to sign. We lobbied for the federal monies to restore the bridge. 80% federal monies, 20% had to be guaranteed by another entity. The city, because they were collaborating with us all of these years, agreed to guarantee the 20%. We then, the restoration group, raised more than $200,000 which we, we, could, we gave to the city. We also got Union Pacific to donate the bridge, which was all a part of what they were doing to not have to pay the 20%. So they went to court to say that because we didn't have a contract with the city in which they paid us to raise money, that the MA MOU did not give us some legal standing. That judge threw that out as well. So we've had two small victories, but we go to court October 7th. Y'all need to be in court. You need to explain to people that when it gets on the ballot, because I pray to the Lord that it's on the ballot, that we vote on whether or not we want a brewery on that land or a park next to the Hay Street Bridge. You can do that. That's one of the things you can do. You, uh, one of the other things that you can do one, one of the other things that you can do is that in the uh, today's Catholic, right now there's a story about a current word university that's looking for a site for a hospital. They've done the wonderful thing of putting their eye clinic at the corner of Commerce and Walters and have named it for Artemisia Bowden, the savior of St. Philip's College. Try to do the hotel, I mean the hospital, at 35 and Walter Street. You can do that. Thank you. We have a couple of folks who like to also talk to Gary and Dylan and Rosetta. Cool. Um, I think I see you back there, friend. Um, so I would just say um, we have to think creatively about how to disobey uh, what is happening. Um, I think there is a pretty awesome and rich legacy in San Antonio of groups who have organized um, in disobedience. Uh, against the powers that be, I think about the um, the folks who jammed up Frost Bank to go after Tom Frost by pulling out their savings, putting them back in, and then went a month later to jam up Jowski's um, by buying a bunch of or buying a bunch of uh, you know goods and jamming up the lines. Right? I, I do think it comes down to um, to disobedience, and we have to be creative and civil. Um, but I, I would think about it in those terms. Yay, Gil! Jailbird Gil! <laughs> I just wanted to say, instead of thinking in terms of as an individual, think about in terms of a community, how you as an individual fit in your community and how you can empower your community.
So people who know me know I'm not actually from San Antonio. And one thing I've noticed since I got here is there's a lot more temp work here than a lot of those. There's a lot more temp work in this city than most other cities I've been into. So I was wondering why you think San Antonio businesses have adopted this model as opposed to other models. Do they actually bring in temps to replace the workers entirely as opposed to just using them as a direct, which is what I'm used to. Did you address that in I think you can address it like personally the way you have lived it. But just as an example, when we uh, created Fiesta Texas, we did it with uh, a huge tax abatement. And one of the things that those of us who are, well, there were very few vocal people against Fiesta Texas. That was a 10 to 1 vote, and I was the only one in the city council who voted against it. But one of the things that I brought up was that in the model they had, most of the workers were going to be seasonal, which are temporary. And to the day, I know people who have been working there since Fiesta Texas opened, and they are still temporary workers. And when you do that, you, you don't have to give them the benefits of full-time workers. So it's cheaper. And as long as there's labor here that will do a very good job for less money, they're going to keep on doing it because to begin with, that should have been part of the tax abatement discussion. In other words, we're not going to give you a tax abatement if you don't commit to having X number of full-time workers. But they would say it's going to be X number of workers, and they didn't uh, dwell on the fact that some of them would be temporary. So when the deals are getting cut for these big discussions, there's no debate. So people don't know uh, what's happening. And I imagine that happens in other areas, too. It's cheaper, and number two, they can get away with it. You would think that a policy like uh, what we've heard uh, this morning about workers at the Hyatt not getting their tips would be something that you would get six people on the city council to say, that's horrible, uh, that can't happen. It's not. In fact, uh, there's not much happening there on this. People can get away with it. My inclination is also to say that it probably has to do with the kind of industries that are the economic base of the city in particular. Tourism, so, um, you know, tourism, and if you have... Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, tourism, service industry, these are, these are you know, what drives the city. The city I'm from is Portland, Oregon. It also has a very large convention industry, a very large tourism industry. But you, while you have temps come into hotels, it's usually not like 60% staff is like temps at all times. That would only happen if there's like a union drive. I mean, they wouldn't just like leave 60% of the staff as temps. So that seems unusual to me. Although, like, but you have to remember that Texas, Texas is a right to work state. So we don't have that union influence to temper the outrageous things that corporations do uh, in order to make money. Okay. I just I, I would I, I would argue, man, just to answer your question, that I think generally it's a problem in uh, the broader economy <laughs> everywhere because uh, I mean even friends of mine who are in say the tech industry in Austin are temp workers now. They don't work for Apple, they work for a temp agency. Professors. Yeah, professors, right? You think about what is, there is a, there's a broader social disintegration that's happening of just permanent labor in the United States that I think we would point to. And, and San Antonio, we happen to be, um, in, I think you gotta think about that. And the other thing you gotta think about is it's a measure of power, it's a measure of worker power, right? And in a place, like here, where there is not a lot of worker power in the convention and hotel industry, you see the temp industry flourish. Um, and I think there are examples, we can talk about it later, of places in the country where workers have been able to organize the hiring hall, right? And the union itself can take the role of providing excess labor when it needs to be and regulate that kind of thing when the workers have enough power to take it over. But other, short of that, they are being exploited through the temporary process. Uh, I'm with Energia Mia and thank you for that or my name is Alice and so my economic development question centers around energy. I know we need to keep our water clean. 
I know, I believe we need half the size of San Antonio, but for, for energy, to me, economic development would be closing down the fossil fuels, stopping the uranium extraction, and use the natural energy that San Antonio is so blessed with the sun, so blessed, well, less blessed, but it would be very cool to have more wind power here, locally, individually, and please not, the new move that nuclear is doing is to have individual nuclear mini plants. Oh my so, goodness, oh Lord. Um, I want to, I hope to see, I visualize um, green workers, workers in natural energy, and research and development, and I know my young Antonieta has included all of these things in her book, but um, other people would like to comment about the green, I have things to say, but they're still um, yeah, that's waiting, so if there are other commenters. I think she had a comment, so. Um, well, the one thing I did want to say is that. What's that? Something on the one thing I did want to say is that as, I mean, I think that the, the new energy economy that the mayor talks about. Um, Greenwash. Yeah, we have to be careful. We have to be critical of that kind of rhetoric in the same ways that we have to be critical of the rhetoric of economic development. Um, in some of the things that I've read from environmental sociology talk about the idea of um, ecological modernity, which is the idea that, well, the solution to environmental problems, is, you know, it can be entirely technological. It can, we don't have to change the overall system in the way that this is, what the system prioritizes in order to fix environmental problems. We can, um, can, we can just get clean tech companies to come. We can just get, uh, you know, we can just convert a portion of our energy portfolio to renewables and not really have to make too many systemic changes. And um, uh, I think we have to be as critical of, of that as we do, and what Alice, yeah, calls greenwashing, um, as we do the rhetoric of economic development. So it's a lot of work. <laughs> Cut out for us. Hey guys, um, I was inspired uh, by working with the West Side, uh, what they're doing with historic development um, on that part of town, and so I started an organization in the South Side that's trying to do the same thing, and uh, we're getting a lot of skepticism from uh, the people there about economic development and what are some of the, uh, the outcomes of that, and one of them is gentrification. And as the South Town development grows, even in the East Side right now, they're going to see some of that happen. And I'm wondering if the councilwoman or anybody else on the panel would comment on that type of outcome of that kind of economic development. Um, talking about outcomes, I live in the Community Hill, which is a historic area. I also live in a house that's on the Department of Interior's listing of historic places is the Emil Elmendorf House. To my surprise, the Liberty Hill neighborhood underwent a massive rezoning exercise. And I discovered that my house on the corner of Hackberry and Burleson was being rezoned from residential to commercial. And that one block south of me, uh, the cottages on Lamar Street between Hanbury and Allen were all being rezoned in this new mixed-use uh, zoning uh, thing that they've got so that you can turn them into the bakeries, the restaurants, the bars, and these kinds of things. The, the Catholic Worker House, which is located on Nolan Street off Hanbury, got rezoned because the Neighborhood Association and the Councilwoman are in their roots so that they can't do what Matthew says you're supposed to do, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, counsel people. Uh, Catholic Worker House cannot cook food in its house any longer and serve three meals a day to the homeless and people who are in need who have come to depend upon that for them. So the, the gentrification of my neighborhood is in full swing. Uh, I had people in my yard, and I went out to ask them, can I help you? And they said, well, this house is for sale, and we're checking it out. 
And I said, well, do you see it for sale sign? And they said, it's listed on the internet. So that is the kind of thing that people in San Antonio will do to communities that they are offering up for gentrification. And unfortunately, the East downtown neighborhoods are, are rife with people who are speculating. I've been burglarized six times because they figure I'm an old lady and they can scare me into leaving my property. And that's not going to happen because I'm a child of the civil rights movement. And they're going to have to burn my house down and dish things in the yard to get rid of me. But that's the kind of thing that is happening in the, the downtown neighborhoods that are close to the tourists, the convention, the entertainment industry. That's part of the reason why the Express News and cahoots with them, you know, have, have articles like this in the paper. Growth downtown catching on in the east side entertainment sites proposed. It's, it's terrible, but the gentrification of, of the old historic neighborhoods is ongoing. And you've got to be really, really paying attention to what's on the, the council calendars because you won't necessarily even know that it's happening to you. <laughs> things I wanted to speak to because we do I mean, we do a lot of cultural preservation work on the west side as as Alexa. It makes a difference who is doing that work, right? Is it the community that's preserving its own history, its own buildings, that's organizing to, to save a building or to remember, to, to make sure you know to to create those archives um, and to honor them or is it this rhetoric of historic preservation that's coming from the top down where speculators and you know, working with the city are coming in through neighborhood and, and oh you know this house is we're going to fix it up and it's displacing and driving long-term residents out so there's a difference i think and we have to again we have to be really critical and maybe that's one way to to sort of talk to your own neighbors about it as well you know, this is an effort that's coming from community. It's not, we're not talking about the kind of historic preservation where, you know, somebody comes in and buys up your house and, and you have to leave. And then there's other tools as well um, that, you know, community land trusts, cooperative businesses, some of those have, are um, kind of um, tools that we could use to safeguard against speculators and other people who are coming in trying to displace neighborhoods, original neighborhoods. Um, so if you look at the last issue of La Voz, and I think there's copies that we brought with us. Um, we did some interviews with people who have sort of concrete solutions uh, to some of these courses that we're talking about today. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to comment this group for coming and seeking, and, I mean, not seeking, but sharing information that is needed because it is warranted that some of the things that you're hearing. But I would like to, with your permission, I would like to have a, make a suggestion. And number two, I would like to uh, comment. And with your permission, only with your permission, that I can do this. Suggestion is that this needs to have a, a part two. Huh? Because it's far a. more deeper a. than what they're a. able to yep. share with us. His view is still wrong. Do y'all agree? Yes. And, and I think, you know, that by having a part two of this, you can get a better grip a better understanding and a better uh, knowledge as to what it's asking of you as people of this community to do and how to go about addressing this. As a comment, and to help you, young man, I am the vice president of the retired AFL-CL Council. And I know all about what y'all are trying to do with the high. The thing is that you have to keep working with the people 
and educating them where their benefits can become liable and we need to make a substantial level. Because that's what unions offer to people. San Antonio has been a city from the McAllister, the good government GPL, has always fought against unions. Why? Because it has kept companies like Ford Motors, companies like GMC, companies like Kellogg, people that will bring business and will offer good job benefits out because they know once the people have control and say so, then it makes a difference. So we have to talk about more empowering the people and understanding what empowering people means. One of the things that why the city gets away with a lot of uh, uh, things that they do and make it because they hire ex-city council people for lobbyists. They know the experience, that, I mean, they have the experience, they know the knowledge, so therefore they can go and do the things that the city wants or those who empower them to do what they want to get out of it because they can control it. The only way you can change that is that to have your legislature and your city council to prohibit of hiring these type of people. And once you prohibit those people from seeking those jobs as lobbyists, then you buy more apt to have a voice and, and, and be able to make some changes. But until then, you're not going to make anything. All you're going to do is talk. Secondly, the community needs to understand that if you're going to make a change in your community, you're going to have to pin down your city council person and hold them to the table of what you want. It makes no sense that this district has to go to court to find out who, who elected them. Who elects them? But let them know, just like I put you there, I can remove you. But until this community comes to learn and understand that, when you talk about illiteracy, people in this city is not totally uneducated. They may not be able to comprehend some of the issues, but if you explain to them what it means to have a difference in, in, in by empowering you, you're going to see a difference. But until they understand that, just to use the word empower, what I'm going to empower, who am I going to empower, why am I going to be an empower? You have to take time. That's why I appeal to this committee. We need a two part to this because you need to explain to people, you explain what the situation is. Now, how are you going to resolve it? And that's the only way, uh, uh, that's the only way you're going to be in here. It's how you're going to resolve it. So I, I am appealing, and I hope, and not to be an offense to anybody, but if you really, really want to make a difference in this community, it has to start with your city council person. It has to, secondly, it has to go with your state representative person. It has to go to your county person and let them know and understand. If you cannot adhere to the things that the system community wants, and then most of all, have a plan. You don't have a plan. You need to work with people, who do I need to get with, and develop a plan so that we can implement and carry forth out what we're trying to bring forth in this community. Thank you. We hear about the abatements and the uh, rebates and all that, but there are other things they do that we don't know about and we're paying for. Uh, one of them is, for instance, um, with SAWS, we are uh, actually subsidizing corporations 
because they use recycled water, but who pays for the plant? We do. And who pays, uh, who pays for the maintenance of the plant and the reconstruction and whatever? Um, CPS, we um, actually get a higher rate than Microsoft. Microsoft. When Microsoft came into San Antonio, the vice president said, uh, we came because the energy is cheap. Okay, so yeah, the workers, there was 75 workers being hired in the whole Microsoft plant, and uh, they were getting a lower rate on the energy than you do. I don't think that's fair. And they don't talk about those things. They talk about, um, for instance, the, the infrastructure. There's, uh, like in downtown now, you can get the water connected, the electricity connected, and you don't have to pay for it because there's an incentive package. And you read about that in the paper, but what you don't know is that your rates are subsidizing them in a very secretive manner. I went the other day to Sauce because I said, how come we're paying $20 for the sewer? You know, I, I'm using, I'm not watering my lawn, etc. She said, well, uh, the rate went up. I said, yeah, does that have to do with uh, the bare met problem? You know, the infrastructure problem? That they're having to re, uh, relay the lines and everything? Well, yes, probably. I mean, the poor woman shouldn't have said that to me, but we all know that we are paying for bare met's infrastructure. And why did the people go to those parts of town? Because they didn't want to pay taxes. Because they didn't want to pay SAWS rates. And now we bought Bear Mat and we're paying for that infrastructure. Another one that I wanted to say, and it's not to blame Mr. Armistica, who's the head of the Bear Appraisal District, because he's been trying to change it at the state legislature. But what happens with your property taxes is that the corporations and the uh, apartments and the mansions, okay, mansions as in Dominion, and the properties like that, pay a lesser rate than you do, okay? So you say, well, how come you're paying so little? They'll tell you, no, I'm paying millions of dollars. Yeah, but their rate is frozen to where, when it was constructed, that's the rate they pay. Why? Because every time those properties change hands, that, uh, Price, selling price is secret. So then the Bear Appraisal District can't make uh, a fair assessment, and so they're being charged on the rate of the property when it was built, all right? So that's another one. Mr. Amesita has tried, and I was at a, a meeting uh, downtown where the governor sent a panel of, you know, of, of paid yes men, I guess, or, or of elected yes men, and Mr. Amesita, the head of our appraisal district, was there fighting. I had to leave because I got tired. I couldn't wait, you know, the entire line to, to have anything to say. But he waited until the end. He's tried with the legislature. And that is, those are three examples of secretive ways that we are subsidizing the corporations. You don't read about it in the paper. And when you do with the appraisal district, it's very convoluted. It's very difficult to understand. So I just want you to know that when you're reading about another corporation coming in with tax breaks, there are hidden ways that you are subsidizing them every single month through your bills. Thank you. And last uh, person in line, thank you for your patience. Oh, well, that's fine. I would like to thank the, the speakers. It's incredible. They say knowledge is power. But knowledge is frustrating, <laughs> sickening. I mean, you go home sick. Uh, you see the apathy. People don't vote. 700,000 people didn't vote in the old election. The registered vote. In my area, only 25 voted out of about 700. So, how do you convince them to vote? They always say, well, I'm always working. But what I wanted to bring forth was something I would say that's on set. That I'm not sure a lot of people are aware of this. You can go and look for your campaign finance reports from the past in the city's website, the city clerk's website. But then last year, something very strange happened at the commissioner's court. Um, this was in 2012, I'm not sure of the date. But on my essay, it came out that Mr. Wolf 
had asked one of the attorneys if it was really legal or for them to be required to show their campaign finance reports as commissioners. Well, what I was not aware of, and I'm, I'm, I mean, please forgive me that I didn't bring that research, but actually there was a law many moons ago in which they can destroy these reports two years after filing. And then when I looked into the state, uh, uh, what is it, state archives, I did find things that happened, in, I can't remember what year it was, but I looked up that year. Unfortunately, whatever related to that specific bill, I could not find, and maybe somebody else can find it. But what urged me to look for this? When I looked at the city clerk's uh, campaign finance reports before voting, this is what it says in the bottom. Campaign finance reports are destroyed in accordance with state library retention schedule. Current regulations require local governments to retain these reports for two years after date of filing. So when I looked up the reports again, it's blank. There's nothing there. Isn't this supposed to be transparent? Doesn't it be, I mean, the only link between us and government is our votes, our vote, and these things don't exist. So, I've been to a lot of meetings. I've been to Sarah meetings, Central Territory meetings, SALS meetings, CPS meetings, all these meetings. And then all of a sudden you start seeing a link. Smart essay meetings regarding light rail. All I saw was gentrification. I said, why don't we go uh, north to south? The traffic is horrible north side. It took me like 30 minutes to run a block. When over here, I could run from, from my side of town over here in 50 minutes or less. Well, no, the property values are too high over there. We're sitting ducks in the east side and the west side of San Antonio. Our property values are low. Now, what really sickens me is that the folks that live like in my area knock on the doors because they're going to do some type of new development in the area. And the elders said, Mijo, of course, son, it's okay, don't worry, because they're going to give us 25000 Well, how big is your house? Oh, it's pretty big when it's two baths. But when I bought it, it was 5000 I made the darn mistake of going and knocking on doors. I made the darn mistake of listening to the Vigasava. Smart growth and all this. Oh, you gotta go to the beach, fight for the water and all this. Well, they really want me up. And I was fighting for this and fighting for that. But then you get burned out, knocking on so many doors and just being stopped out. So I'm glad to see, but y'all have died. So I did that. <laughs> so, yes, because you do really get burned out after a while. This is our country. And what was really sad, I looked at you can have a because I lived in the fire. And we have a West Side Development Corporation that keep an eye on because they're already using Sarah for something else. Did you know Hong Kong treats its people better than we do? Hong Kong. I was like, what? I mean, I mean, they treat their elders with respect. If you have a three bedroom house, two baths, they'll find you the same house making sure that your financial situation is not distorted. Because remember, when you get another house, you can get another level of income. I mean, another value. So your taxes are going to be higher. And I was like, this is unbelievable. So that's all I have to say. Remember, we need to look into why is it campaign finance reports at that time, many months ago, were changed. Thank you. Thank you, Right now, we're closing in on 12.30. Uh, part of what I had wanted to think about was exactly what Reverend was proposing, that there would be some kind of part two, some kind of next steps, that we're not just having this conversation, but we're also following up with some kind of action. Um, and part of that action, I would really like to continue the conversation about how do we know what it is, how do we know to recognize what it is that we actually want to see? And I kind of took some notes as the panelists were speaking of, um, you know, what are the criteria that we use to measure what we want to see. I really like what Megan was saying about um, 
altruistic models versus mercenary models and money that's coming into a community, staying in the community, or at least not leaving the community right away. Um, things like libraries, environmental policy, literacy rates, better housing, quality schools, good jobs, some service, you know, healthcare technology. Maria's questions from Banana Shiva about does it does development build up nature, does it destroy it, does it build people up, or does it, does it, does it exploit them? Um, I would really like us to have a collaborative process where we're coming up with a kind of community plan that lays out those criteria so that we're not always on the defensive, just saying, no, 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 stop this, stop that, stop that, but we actually have you know, a proactive, positive, kind of model of what we want to see. Um, so there's a, I mean, there's different ways we can do it. We can, there's, you can come join the meetings that are already happening around Hasty Bridge Restoration Group. We are planning on, we were talking about having a meeting maybe July 6th, although Gary says that that might not be a good weekend because it's the 4th of July weekend. Um, so, but we should talk about, do we want to gather next? kind of take those next steps. The West Side Preservation Alliance meetings happen every every other Tuesday at the Rincontito de Esperanza, which is uh, 816 South Colorado. So there's kind of multiple venues depending on where you're living, which side of town you're living on. Um, the next meeting for that is July 11th. I don't know, the, the young man who was here who was talking about the South, South Side group, I don't know if he, if you all have meetings you want to announce, Okay, but different things happening on different sides of town. Um, how do folks feel about coming to and having continuing some of this discussion in the Hay Street Bridge Restoration Group meeting? And if that's a good option, where I mean, what when is a good time for us to have that meeting? To, to have the part two that you were kind of talking about. And we were, Sounds too haphazard the way we're doing it. Uh, did you get uh, a list of people and how to? Do it? Well, why don't you then uh, think about what dates that you can carry this through and then do it. Uh, to, to make a decision right now, I'm not sure uh, that 
Yeah, just show of hands. Are people interested in another meeting? Yes. Okay. Are weekends better or day Monday through Thursday? Okay. So uh, we're we're gonna go ahead and make sure. That's why we were passing that signature sheet so we can follow up and hopefully with within the next month we can have this continuous this the continuity of this conversation. And also, I'm just going to announce that on July 13th, we have a film screening of My Brooklyn with a filmmaker that's coming in from Brooklyn. Um, same sort of, it's about gentrification. And, you know, so she's been screening that all over New York area. But, you know, we want to learn from what's going on over there. And we already have this, those conversations. Um, so we invite you to come to that. But she'll also be around afterwards. Yes, they're flyers. Um, so that, you know, we want a smaller conversation, she'll be available as well for that. And again, they're not the experts, they want that exchange as well. But, okay, so we have a weekend and all these folks here, and then what you also want to do is continue to invite more people. And then ultimately, when we talk about community school, is how, these, how you gain this information, and then you're able to have those same conversations in your smaller neighborhoods, in your own homes, and you continue to, t you, you become the teacher because you have the information, you have the knowledge, you have the experience, and we just keep on building. And, you know, any of us uh, can all be there to be support, but really we have the knowledge and we know what's going on that's wrong, so we just need to build our movement. I don't need one. I don't need one. I don't need one. I don't need one. You know, understanding is, is, is great, and you know, I think we've, we've uh, met uh, a lot of understanding this morning, and I'm sure they'll pull it together. But I think what the Reverend is saying is very important that we do some sort of near term change. You know, there's long term change, intermediate, but we get something out of this next planning meeting that we actually do something. Okay. Well, well, maybe I'm a little bit confused, but I, I, I didn't think this was a planning meeting to start uh, a movement. Because I think it's very difficult to, to assume that we're all on the same page, we're all from the same neighborhoods, we're all from. And, and, and I, I think we've got to slow down a little bit. The uh, expectations are too high. I am very, also very, uh, uh, how would I say it? Uh, I get frustrated with the fact that we don't go with the jumping tracks. And that's why, you know, I always say I like to jump into the fire. I don't do the dark, right? and, and do what we have to do. But, but the, the function, we have to define this function. I thought that the, 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 the function of this group was to sit create conversations. You know, and not, and not put the burden on, well, we're going to have to do some action to do it. You'll, 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 you'll drop it like that. Because there's not going to be very many actions coming out to lose. Uh, uh, that's, that's what I thought. Well, my, I guess my concern is that there, there are things already happening in the community. There's already movement being created. Um, and my hope would be to encourage folks and to invite folks that now have this knowledge to, to participate in the things that are already going on. So come to the next Hay Street Bridge Restoration Group meeting. Um, the date hasn't been set, but we have all of your contact information now and we'll be able to let you know when it is coming up and really encourage you to participate. Um, and now you understand how that very, very seemingly small local struggle connects to all of the other issues that are citywide. Um, come to the West Side Preservation Alliance meetings. Um, yes. August 1st, um, I didn't say it, but we are um, holding city council to the table, trying to push uh, legislation to stop the tip that is happening. It's called the Mikia Law, um, and we're having a meeting uh, that is open to the community August 1st. Um, and you can, through my soul, get our contact info and location. Where? 
I don't know precisely the time. Typically, we do it at five in the evening, um, and it will probably be held in the Granada Homes on the 15th floor in the Walnut Room. Uh, if you know where that is downtown. But you come talk to me after, give me more details. And 4th of July, come to the Hay Street Bridge and enjoy all of the fireworks because you'll be able to see the ones at Hemisphere Park, you'll be able to see the ones at Woodlawn, you'll be able to see the ones at the Scorpion uh, Stadium down in the north side. Come and just feel it. We've had 400 people uh, on, on the bridge watching the fireworks and it shows that this is a people's place and we don't want it privatized. So come out and show your solidarity. And if the city has their way, this may be the last time. Um, and then that's also gonna happen on Sunday as well. Uh, I think that's also going till nine. They got some food there if you're hungry as well. Where? It's 1416 East Commerce. So are y'all comfortable in kind of switching strategies just a little bit? Uh, instead of having the follow-up be a large meeting you know, at the end of the month, instead keeping on top of the meetings that are already going on, you know, we'll add you to our list and starting to attend, starting to come out and to support those you know, the movements that are already underway. I'm going to show of hands if y'all are comfortable with that. The people not raising their hands, is it because you still prefer like a, a large meeting specific to planning? I'm just worried about diluting our energy. Um, diluting our energy? Um, so this school, uh, if I understand it, with, you know, with what she presented to us, um, helping, empowering us so that we cut through the semantics and we understand what's really going on, I think that's very necessary because we're all sort of talking the same things, but uh, we, unfortunately buy into the politicians' whole agenda because we don't understand the code. And I think the code is what we need to learn as a community so that we can defend ourselves. You know, with, um, with um, uh, spousal abuse, I, I uh, contributed work to a, a, a film that was done. And I had no idea because fortunately it hadn't happened to anybody that I knew. You know, uh, spousal abuse and, and that whole uh, area of the children and how it affects them and all that. And it was after that that I started sensing whenever I heard somebody say something, uh, you know, that was either demeaning or or trying to intimidate me. Then I, I kind of had the words uh, clarified in my head so that I could recognize it and repel those people and take them out of my life. You know, not that I was gonna uh, succumb to them, but, but I'm just telling you that the codes are, are very important, and I found this very useful, that you were giving us cutting through the, the verbiage and the semantics that they use, because that's one of the reasons that they've stayed in power. And this goes back to the founding of San Antonio, where you know, the, the outsiders always came in, and they controlled. And I don't want to name any names, but uh, we've had that same situation since our founding. Outsiders come in, they control, and then they Reasons, and then when we're no longer any good, they throw us away, and then they get fresh people. And this, I think, this school that you're, uh, this white this with, is very important. So, I'm s who are the folks that still want to have like the big meeting at the end of July? And who are the folks that prefer to continue this work? in existing spaces that are already organizing. How do you suggest that we, that we sort of resolve that difference in uh, preference for strategies? Yes. Can I just say, I, I, I don't think there's a difference. I think we need to recognize that the right wing revolution um, has succeeded because they know to control the ideas the schools, the media, the, cu the culture. And for 40 years, I've been at meetings where people say, we have to get brave and go do action because it's manly and we've lost. We need to, to be able to have that information available to community so that we can um, uh, fight the um, dominance 
that the right wing has had over our media, over our ideas, over our schools. That's what I think the action of educating ourselves and our communities is about. It's very much about an action, and I believe it's an action that is much more likely to um, lead to uh, serious change than any one isolated action that we are planning. So, let me just propose to you it's very important that we have kind of clarity on what happens next. Um, there's many, many opportunities for you to come to meetings that are already ongoing, and, as, and, and we will follow up with the folks who attended here by sending out a list of those and times and places. I also think that if you are so inclined and you feel strongly within your own community and neighborhood that you want to organize a, a large community meeting to continue these conversations at the end of July or, or whenever, then I think that that should be done. I think that multiple strategies will be necessary. Um, how do folks feel with that? Are you feel good about that? Okay. So we will see you. Um, thank you very much for coming out. And there's lots of stuff for you to plug into. Thank you. And thank you to NowCast. Thank you again to Thank you back to the So NowCast now videotaped this. So please um, get online and get your friends to listen in. So we had about 75 folks here today. Let's let all our friends and family members know about it and watch it.